Welcome, everybody. I am Adeshewa Josh, and this is Africa Matters. This week, we explore the potential and pitfalls of artificial intelligence in Africa. A growing number of Western countries, including the United States, the European Union, and Britain, have all banned the use of the TikTok app from government devices citing security threats. Lawmakers fear TikTok and its parent company in China, ByteDance, may use the app to covertly collect sensitive user data and pass it on to the Chinese government. But in Africa, technology giants like Meta and Twitter appear to pose a different challenge. They've been accused of doing little to stop the spread of misinformation and stoking violence. In Kenya, Meta is facing three lawsuits, including former employees of Sama, the company's main outsourcing contractor in East Africa, over poor working conditions and labor abuses. Anne Masharia has been following these cases and brings us the latest from Nairobi. A few months ago, a 60-year-old professor, Amaria Brehab, was killed during a series of coordinated assassinations in Bahir Dar, the capital of Ethiopia's Amhara region. In seeking justice, his family isn't going after armed groups. They are, instead, they are targeting Facebook parent company Meta. Amara's family claims that Facebook's internal algorithm highlighted armed groups produce materials, radicalizing the extremist that killed their father. They sued the tech giant in a case that made it all the way to Kenya's law courts. Facebook was not responsive to the reports. And due to that, it was a place where the war was happening virtually. Like as, as much as the war was happening on the ground uh, using weapons, the f Facebook has turned itself to a war front where people were exposed to uh, dangerous messages and faced serious uh, risks to their life and to their freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, are as if you ask me why this was happening, it's because of the business model of Facebook. Uh, Facebook has a business model that promotes uh, uh, messages or posts that, that get a lot of attention. Another headache Meta is facing is a court battle with Sama an outsourcing company that moderated Facebook content in Kenya. Their lawsuit alleges labor abuses and the prevention of unionization in their Kenya offices. Research by Mozilla Foundation shows, despite several lawsuits against social media companies, Facebook and TikTok do not live up to their integrity pledges. Social media could be opening up Africa's horizon. But the weight of setting guardrails for how gig economy should be regulated in the continent lies in the hands of Africa's policymakers. The demand for more accountability from tech companies comes as Africa sees a rising investment in AI-driven businesses and technological innovations. The United Nations International Telecommunication Union for Artificial Intelligence says African countries held wealth worth about $500 trillion last year. And tech analysts predict AI could expand Africa's economy by $1.5 trillion in less than a decade. That's nearly 50% of its current GDP. Africa lacks a continental-wide policy guiding the use of AI, but several African countries like Mauritius, Kenya, and Egypt have developed national strategies to ensure growth, compliance, and equal distribution of wealth. Let's get more from Jonathan Ofeanza, a publisher at Africa Briefing Magazine. He joins me from London. Thank you so much for speaking to Africa Matters. First, let's have your take on the lawsuits against Meta in Kenya. Can social media giants like that be held accountable for malpractices on the continent? They should be held accountable. I mean, um, for a long time, um, foreign companies, you know, especially multinationals, you know, have um, operated in Africa and um, done things with impunity. So I'm rather happy that um, some workers, staff of uh, Meta, you know, I decided to stand up against uh, any more practice against them, you know, by taking them to court. But I hope the judiciary will be strong enough, you know, to, 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 to hold Meta to account. Yes, so um, Big companies, big front companies like Meta, yes, should be held accountable. 
for any malpractice you know, on the continent. But should African governments also be worried about uh, TikTok being a security threat? I wouldn't say so. Look, uh, TikTok has security in the US and the UK and other Western countries, you know, is because um, they believe that uh, TikTok would, uh, well, the, they believe that uh, the Chinese government is behind TikTok and um, they will use that to sort of uh, infiltrate their, well, security, spy systems, defense systems. But Africa don't, don't have that problem. Look. Uh, what do you mean there, that Africa does not have that problem? We don't have hang on because the, in, my, in my opinion, Africa's problem is security. We talk about security, we talk about terrorism. Okay, I'm not sure the Chinese government, you know, is going to, I could be wrong, but I'm not sure the Chinese government is going to aid terrorism on the continent. After all, look, Huawei... You don't has, think African governments and, and just in general, we sh should be worried about cyber, cyber security? Or we cyber should terrorism. be worried about, we should be worried about cyber security, yes. But, I mean, my point is that uh, African countries compared to Western nations like US, Britain, they are not in, a, in, in any major rivalry you know, with China, okay? If anything, China partners Africans in Africa's development. So whereas um, uh, it is rather the opposite when it comes to China and the US or the UK or Germany or, or Germany and so on and so forth, okay? Look, Huawei, Huawei has been banned uh, in the UK, has been banned in the UK, uh, so in the US from uh, operating some 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 technology backbones, but we talk about Africa. Huawei is is present in most African countries. Look, you talk about Uganda. That that comes immediately to mind. The Uganda's um, uh, CCTV systems, uh, 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 Facebook related systems, are all operated by by Chinese companies. So if a country like Uganda, you know, had that worry that um, uh, China, you know, might might, might sort of uh, infringe upon their security systems. Would it have engaged you know, Huawei you know, to help with, with the installation of your face recognition systems you know, in the country in the first place? Right. But should there be a continent-wide strategy that protects uh, tech developers, the tech hub in, uh, in Africa, against certain practices from big tech companies like labor abuses and, and finding a way around um, laws that protect their workers? Yes. I mean... So just like you know, every government should uh, protect uh, its uh, its people from exploitation by foreign undue exploitation by foreign companies. Yes, it applies to 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 tech uh, global tech companies operating on the con on the continent as well. Yes, so the government should take steps to protect every every employee of every major tech company operating in uh, in Africa. Yes, the government should do that. Well, what sort of impact would that have on our growth, tech growth in the long run? Because um, tech experts are saying that Africa uh, will see a lot of growth in the technology sector, in investments in AI. And if things continue to go at the pace at which it is going in terms of investment, don't you think laws need to be in place to check the excesses of big tech companies? Yes, laws need to be in place. But again, you, see, you talk about this, it all boils down to the political will of the government. Okay? I was talking to somebody in um, Iswatini the other day, in Babani, Iswatini, formerly Swaziland. And this person was complaining about the high cost, high data costs in the country, right? I used to communicate uh, uh, with this person, you know, by WhatsApp video. And he said, look, let's cut this WhatsApp video because it's costing me too much money. Look, um, 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 we, let's take that for example. In Ghana, we have the National Communications Authority that regulates you know, um, the, 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 the mobile companies you know, over there. But tell me, I mean, they don't do much you know, to hold these companies to account. They don't do much to keep them in line. You see, so there must be that political will on the part of our governments to make sure that these tech companies, these mobile companies, all of them uh, uh, operate you know, within the confines of the laws of the respective countries they operated in. So it's the political will I'm talking about. Thank you, Jonathan Ofe Ansa.
a publisher at Africa Briefing Magazine. Thank you so much for speaking to Africa Matters. Thanks for having me. A lot of people are now interacting, debating, getting their news and information online. And TRT Africa, launched on Friday in Istanbul, hopes the new digital platform will inform, engage with and amplify African voices in English, French, Swahili and Hausa. Kubra Akoc has more. Are we ready? Three, two, two one. A fairer and more accurate representation of the African continent and its people when it comes to global media. That's the vision of TRT Africa, the freshly launched digital platform of Turkey's public broadcaster, TRT. What we are going to do at TRT Africa is to change the narratives. You know, uh, all over the world, especially international media organizations, Western media especially, are only reporting war, hunger, diseases about Africa. Africa is beyond that. The launch is part of a growing strategic cooperation between Turkey and countries across Africa. As a reflection of the relations between Turkey and Africa based on equality and mutual gain, we are happy to see that cooperation between our institution and similar institutions in the region has gained great acceleration in the field of public broadcasting. In the past two decades, Ankara, alongside African counterparts, have worked to enhance partnerships economically and politically, as well as cooperate on humanitarian projects. On the other hand, it's also uh, an, an, uh, an opportunity for the African people to have their stories being told in different platforms in the world. When you have the other internationals telling the stories of Africa, and you have an additional one that's a benefit to the African nations and also is going to, to boost the relations between the two sides. The number of Turkish embassies across the continent has increased from 12 to 44, and Turkey's total trade volume has expanded from around $4 billion to more than $40 billion in the last 20 years. This Turkey olarak Turkey is ready to share all our opportunities and experience in the field of media and communication, including the strong capacity we have developed in the fight against disinformation, which is one of the biggest threats to individuals, societies and states in African countries. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has visited more African countries than any other non-African leader and his vision of the world is bigger than five has shaped Turkey-Africa ties. Initiatives like TRT Africa look to further boost relations while showcasing the heart of Africa. Kübra Akoc, Africa Matters. About nine out of ten students in sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to household computers, according to the UN's education agency, UNESCO. Darren, I understand there could be a solution in the horizon in Uganda. That's right. Advances in technology are quickly transforming the world. And it's no different here, in one of Kampala's tech hubs, where I'll be finding out how one scientist is contributing to this change by making small computers. Matilda Tino is a passionate teacher with more than 15 years of experience. She uses tablets during class at this public school in Kampala. They are a useful teaching tool, but they are never enough. We have a big enrollment in a class like P4 today. I've been handling 159 with only 30 tablets. And it, makes diff it, it, it becomes difficult for me, for the children, because the tablets are very few, they, all of them do not get a chance to hold it. So they keep on struggling because they want to hold it. Then the other thing is, uh, on top of that, of course, the knowledge of computer. Not all the teachers have the knowledge of using the computer, so there are only a few classes that go into the lab to use those computers. The school's more than 900 students must share just three desktop computers. Ivan Karugaba and his team want to change that. The mechanical engineer has built a simple device called a microfuse stick computer. My major inspiration was uh, the fact that most students, uh, especially at university, didn't have access to 
to computers to use for their coursework. And I actually got to see the magnitude of this situation uh, when I lost my computer. So I took a whole year without a computer just because uh, coming up with a sum uh, of about uh, 1.2 to 2 million shillings was, was not uh, an easy thing. So uh, that is when I and my co-founder uh, saw that we needed to do something about this. After designing the structure of the device, they used 3D printing to build a prototype. And now it's in production. Components are manufactured in China and the pieces are assembled at this workshop. The final product can be plugged into the HDMI port of any display screen. A microfuse stick computer like this is user-friendly. It is light and portable, and it consumes about 5 watts of power, which is a lot less than a laptop or desktop. Ivan's team has the capacity to produce 100 devices a day, and they retail for $65 each. At the moment, only around 2% of Ugandans own a computer or laptop. But this new tech has the potential to change the e-learning space. You can load applications uh, such as uh, e-libraries. Then uh, you can also load uh, other applications such as uh, digital laboratories where students can carry out experiments virtually. Uh, in addition to that, our technology has applications uh, where students can access content, that is uh, school content, uh, in form of text, audio, video. And uh, in future, actually, we look at uh, uh, this device uh, having the capability and the required connectivity for students to uh, do quizzes and tests online. Ivan has a broad vision. He plans to increase his company's worth tenfold to $50 million by 2028. Finding skilled workers in hardware design is a challenge, but by training more engineers, he hopes to expand his reach throughout the African continent. Darren Alan Cheyune, Africa Matters, Kampala, Central Uganda. To Cameroon's Anglophone regions now, where an armed conflict has entered its sixth year. Local residents are using humor and laughter as a way of dealing with their trauma. The conflict between the military and separatist forces from the northwest and southwest is rooted in the reunification of the two regions which were colonized by the French and British governments. Paul Ngia reports from Boya. 23-year-old Elof Marie Cleophas is an internally displaced person in the city of Boya, capital of Cameroon's southwest region. Four years ago, she and her family sought refuge there after violence broke out in her native Bafia village between the English-speaking separatist fighters and state forces. She has been traumatized and depressed since then. We left because the lives of students were being threatened. And since we were going to school, we had to leave to come to Boya. Whenever Marie Cleophas is not in school, she's at this family bar just next to her house, helping her mother serve drinks to customers. And in her free time, she relies on her phone for entertainment. She spends hours online each day looking at skits featuring local comedians. It's her own way of healing. So when I watch them, I'm happy. I take, I take my mind off my stress and my thoughts. And gradually I'm healing because if that makes me happy almost every day, because I spend six hours of my time watching Auntie Felicia's comedies. Local comedians do whatever they can to ensure the people are happy. The International Crisis Group says more than 6,000 people have been killed and more than half a million others displaced since 2017. Kuo Elonge is an actor who plays the character Auntie Felicia. He started at the peak of the conflict and now has a massive online following. His skits resonate with ordinary people. He says his comedy is not just to entertain, but also to help people recover from their negative experiences. What we try to do is to uplift, um, because people are already down. Um, the crisis already has dealt a severe blow on our lives in every aspect that you can think about. So my role is not to remind people of their pain, but to provide kind of solace to them, kind of comfort to them. And I think that's why people gravitate towards it. Psychologists agree 
that comedy can indeed be a form of therapy. Since the Anglophone crisis started in 2016-2017, uh, people have faced a lot of trauma. They have faced a lot of pain due to the killings and so on, and the destruction. And as an applied positive psychology, I want to say that comedy has a great role to play to release the pain of people. The Anglophone armed conflict remains highly unpredictable as there is no clear end in sight for the unrest. But now that people here have chosen to look beyond the fighting and atrocities in favor of comic relief, there seems to be an aura of hope. Hope that one day they will laugh out loud freely without having to worry about the next gunshot. Paul Nje, Africa Matters, Boya, Cameroon. You've heard of the FIFA World Cup. Now say hello to the Granny's Soccer World Cup. The tournament, the first of its kind, is hosted by South Africa's Vakegula Vakegula Football Club and has attracted the attention of sporting grandmas all around the world. Eunice Emre has more. So, one. Like any loving grandmother, one, Flora Beloy four, spends much of her time nurturing her five, five grandsons. Six, but this grandma, this affectionately known Zambi. as Gogo here, does more than I bake cookies Zambi. and read to youngsters. I am a striker. I play position E11. For me, you, to strike, I feel I feel good when I strike, and when I strike, even my inner emotion, I strike. I strike physical and inside me. So a lot of toxins come out of me when I am striking. Flora plays for Vakagula Football Club, a football team that only accepts women aged 55 and up. Her passion for the game is apparent from how she plays. But Flora originally joined to help solve her medical problems. It helped me because I was on arthritis a, a treatment and I was going to have another operation. So I didn't go for another operation. I'm no more taking the pills for the pains. Uh, after exercises, I just sleep. I sleep peacefully. She joined the club in 2017, and she's seen a great improvement in her health since then. At this age, at my age, I think if I was not in this uh, uh, spot, I should have been confined in a wheelchair. As the word spread, more and more football teams joined the league. In fact, they've garnered so much attention, they've hosted their first international tournament, dubbed the Grannies Football World Cup. 23 teams came from abroad to play in the four-day tournament, in addition to nine from South Africa. And although the competition makes them rivals on the field, their reasons for coming together are the same. We love it. It means so much to us. It's a community, makes us healthy, and we know that they want the same thing. So we are so excited to be here to meet all the people in Africa. The U.S. took home the Granny Cup this year, trailed closely by France. But a trophy means little, after winning more time to play the game of life. Yunusemre, Africa Matters. For our Africa City profile this week, we head to the southernmost tip of the African continent. There lies a modern South Africa's oldest city. Set in the shadow of the picturesque Table Mountain, Cape Town began as an important stop on international shipping routes. Today, it ranks among the top tech cities in Africa. Let's take a look. That's our show this week. Please share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas on what you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle at Adeshawa Josh. You can watch this episode and more on YouTube. 
Just search Africa Matters TRT World. Like, comment, and share. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next week.